Oh, I didn't see you there. My name is McKenzie, and I'm here to tell you a few uh, relatively unknown coffee facts or answer coffee questions. Um, and I'd like to start with the legend of how coffee was discovered. So we may not know exactly how true this is, but as the legend stands, there was a, uh, an Ethiopian goat herder by the name of Kaldi, or Khalid. There are conflicting reports. But he was uh, essentially a goat herder slash monk, and he realized that whenever his goats would eat cherries from this one particular bush, they would get really excited and start dancing, as he said. So they would eat these cherries, they would, you know, start going crazy, hopping all over the place. So he started to take the cherries himself, and he sort of made a tea with them. And he realized that the tea was invigorating. As a godly man, because uh, the legend says he's a monk so they started making it regularly because the caffeine in these like coffee cherries uh, helped them pray longer and so this one like random herd of goats just trying to get a snack started uh, the world's greatest addiction so the main difference between blade grinder and a burr grinder is consistency which like the difference between a good cup and a bad cup of coffee is consistency. So when you're using a blade grinder, it's very random. And so the coffee's all sitting in the little hopper, sort of being wildly smacked about by a couple of blades. So you'll have very big pieces, you'll have finely pulverized pieces. Whereas if you get a burr grinder, and there are different kinds, but there are a lot that are available even from Amazon uh, at most. Without using a brand name, uh, I've had my $100 burr grinder for six years now. It's a good investment, and the burr grinder, you've got, like if you get one and you open it up, what you'll find is they almost look like gears, and they move in concentric circles to crush the coffee, you know, instead of a blade, which is very random. This is pushing all the coffee beans that are the same size through the same space and being crushed at generally the like a consistent level. So it's a good investment if you're gonna keep doing you know, this kind of thing. I mean, I kind of told you guys about it earlier. I think as much as people think they like really dark coffee, I think what they really like is, you know, if you go to interstate exit breakfast places and the coffee's very thin and very like almost metallic people think they like coffee like darker than that but really they're chasing like body and more character and so to me bad coffee is coffee that's so over roasted as to like almost spoil and if you do get a burr grinder and you get that super super dark coffee uh, it's gonna slowly like ruin your machine. It clogs up grinders. It's just like some of the bigger coffee chains. It's way easier to make dark consistent because you're really just burning it. So in the same way like a well done steak, it's hard to mess up compared to another well done steak. Darker coffee is easier to hide uh, other coffee imperfections. Just the grind. You can make espresso with anything. Even your, if you took your, you know, your lightest roast coffee and you got the grind right, you could do espresso. I mean, there's several coffee shops that do like single origin espressos and they're really light and they, you know, instead of tasting like what you think of as espresso might taste like blueberries and flowers and stuff like that. And you know, it's just very strong. All espresso is, is a, a very quick, very small cup of coffee. If you remember the French press, we used 50 grams of coffee. So like, in this cup is probably 20 grams of grounds whereas there's like 18 grams of grounds in just the like little bit of espresso right so it's just louder and faster and you know shorter decaf's a different animal there's several processes and they're all bizarre 
like one process, I think they even do it with the, with the green coffee beans before they roast. They'll basically soak them in water with charcoal and then the charcoal binds with the caffeine, but it also removes a whole bunch of flavor. That's why decaf tends to be kind of weak tasting, uh, unless it's super dark. So like decaf is often dark just because if you try and brew, like I've had decaf espresso that tasted like raisin bran, like weedy and really empty. And it's because most of the decaffeination process has also removed the flavor just by virtue. There aren't like, at least that I know of, there's probably gonna be a lot of comments proving me wrong, but I, there aren't any naturally occurring decaffeinated yeah. coffees. It's all done in post. Whole bean, cause like ground coffee, even if you go to a store, you get the, them to grind the whole bean coffee for you. You know, much like we were talking about with the dark roasted coffee beans. So if you take a whole coffee bean that's been roasted, in it are a lot of oils and a lot of gases. So once you grind it, it increases the surface area where these oils can dry up and these gases can escape. If you take whole bean and you keep it like wrapped up in the metal plastic that most coffee comes in, it keeps the gases and the oils from escaping. And so that's what makes, you know, that super fresh coffee smell in the morning. It's honestly worth buying whole bean and getting a grinder just for the smell of grinding your own coffee in the morning. Probably going like going cheap, you know, on the beans themselves. A lot of people I find I'm gonna get some more at work later. Um, <clears throat> I feel like a I feel like a lot of people want coffee to still be cheap. The price of the actual beans in the farmland and like the growers prices themselves are going up so high. Two different main varietals of coffee. There's Robusta and uh, Arabica. And Robusta beans are often those like big, big, big coffee companies in like, that you get in the big tins. And Robusta grows like corn, right? Rows and rows that are exposed to sunlight, a lot of pesticides. They're like factory farm style growing processes. Now not all Arabica, but a lot of Arabica beans and a lot of like, especially coffee roasters, you know, they might be shade grown and they're organic or they're bird friendly. And so there's, you know, a lot of coffee designations, there's fair trade, there's things like that where like, you know, you know, it's a collection of small farms, a lot of like third wave coffee that I talk about, a lot of your local roasters will even have partnerships with like an individual farm and they'll get, you know, hundreds of pounds just from one farm and instead of paying the market price of I'm making it up but you know five dollars a pound they might agree to pay you know nine dollars a pound just to help out the farm to make sure that like coffee growers of the world are actually surviving a lot of people that have the old the older view that coffee's supposed to be you know two dollars for endless refills forget that as the world starts to change temperature, like coffee needs a certain elevation. And as the world is warming, like that elevation is getting less and less. You know, the higher the elevation you go, the less of it there is. And so it's getting harder to grow coffee. It's getting more expensive because now larger markets like India and China are becoming coffee drinking countries. And so there's just more people drinking coffee and less room to grow it. I, I like my coffee black. Uh, my favorite growing region is uh, Ethiopia, specifically Yirgacheff. Uh, a lot of those African coffees, especially Ethiopian coffees, have a natural like blueberry taste to them. The first time you actually get to try one of those coffees, you know, you know, you don't have to have a song like a sommelier palate to taste those like tiny descriptors in wine, and the coffee's not flavored. It's just like it's kind of cool the natural terroir, like the the African soil makes all a lot of these coffees taste like like blueberries civet coffee no to me that's the second biggest coffee mistake okay is <laughs> is uh there's a lot of growing regions that it, it, i think successful because of the name so like jamaica blue mountain uh that's monkey poop coffee and even to an extent sumatra it's like since they're touted as being better, the people that make those coffees don't have to do it well. 
but you just have to do it from that area. So like Jamaica Blue Mountain isn't better than any other coffee growing region if the people making it are making bad coffee. Or Civic Coffee is just kind of a, it's a gimmicky, you know. If you really wanted to try and look for like the best coffee uh, that didn't go through an animal's digestive system, because like what the what the the monkey cat is doing is instead of uh, other like dry fermenting processes for uh, getting the coffee cherry away from the coffee beans, because in every coffee cherry you've seen a coffee beans like flat on one side, it's two beans that look like this, right? And so it's surrounded by cherry and like you know several other parts of the fruit. So a lot of places will like lay it out to dry and you know the fruit will slowly dry and ferment and then they'll basically wash it off and you'll have the green coffee beans that they'll ship over here to be roasted. So the monkey cat is basically eating the fruit and the seeds are just there afterwards. But there's a really cool coffee that's very rare, it's very expensive, but especially if a good roaster gets their hands on it, it's worth it, it's called geisha. It's a naturally, it's, it grows on hillsides and is like picked by farmers on donkeys. Like you can't really farm it. So it's just like, they just go and find it on their, you know, with their, I guess, mules or whatever. But I've had it a few times and it is pretty pricey, but it was, it was, it was kind of surprising that there was that much of a difference. Like pro professionally, we would go so far as to try not to use an espresso blend between like before five days and after like 12 or 13 days because espresso is so volatile. I mean, honestly, I would almost say I wouldn't go longer than a month from the roast date if I could help, uh, especially if you're paying a decent amount for whole bean coffee. Why let it get past that point or why not? Like when you when you go to buy the coffee and you're checking the roast dates, you know why not give yourself the most time to like get the best? Because the the actual answer is you could probably get palatable coffee for you know three or four months after roast day. Also, like why why give it a chance? And once you open the bag, as long as it's like airtight sealed somehow, uh, it should keep for just as long. I don't recommend putting anything in the freezer or the fridge. It just creates a different set of variables. Uh, a Chemex has, typically, it's got the thickest filter, and so it's gonna be the lightest, like, cup of coffee, which is why I tend to recommend using lighter roasts where you, like, you taste it like a wine, or you've got, like, a really nice, light cup of coffee, like a, an Ethiopian, and you, like, really wanna get the blueberries. So that thick filter is gonna remove a lot of those uh, solids that the French press gives you. Because the French press is like the least filtered coffee you can pretty much get. You know, it's just like barely a fine mesh. What do I love about coffee? Um, oh man, okay, I'm glad you asked that. Because I'm also in cocktails and I love liquids. And the reason I love liquids is because humans, besides water, don't need them. So like food makes sense, right? Like people that cook and like, you have hunter and gather vegetables and then animals over here. And then like, you know, you, you need calories and different kinds of vitamins. Whereas liquids like serve no purpose evolutionarily, except that we like to taste things, which is really cool to me, which is why I like, you know, bar says like, you have a absolutely packed bar of people just like, or a packed coffee shop of people that just like finding different ways to like drink a liquid that if they, if they didn't have, they would not only survive, but probably be better for it. But instead we're like, <laughs> instead we're like, here's $20 just so I can be, oh yeah, wow. Like just for a new, like tiny experience. So that's also what's cool about uh, coffee specifically is, is let's say you love wine, right? You, how do you get the best wine? It's gonna be, you know, you might could find a, what, a thousand dollars a bottle, like available at like the highest end you could get at a liquor store or, uh, whiskey, you know, if you finally get your hands on that, like, you know, several hundred dollar Pappy Van Winkle or some sort of like 26 year aged scotch, costs hundreds and thousands of dollars to like have the best, but to like have the best coffee, it's the difference between like $2 at a gas station and like four fifty at the highest end coffee shop. And so like coffee's cool because it's like the great equalizer. Like you can have the best, 
just as easily. And like once you get used to making it, almost even easier than like having the worst, you know? That's yeah, kind of fun, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Dude, that was awesome.